Coming up on this week's show, a lost Super Mario World level has been discovered. We chat to Nostalgia Nerd about his new arcade bar. And we go inside the world of dungeon crawlers with Vic Flu. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our great friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books we highly recommend, the unofficial SNES Pixel Book, celebrating Nintendo's fabulous 16-bit machine, boasting lavish design, hundreds of screen grabs and cutouts as well, a real celebration of the Super Nintendo. So you can check that out on the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 370, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And very nice to have you joining us for the podcast that each and every Friday winds back the clock and takes you back to the good old days of video games. And of course, brings you an interview on the show each week with someone really interesting, a veteran of the industry, someone who's doing really interesting things in the retro space right now. And we bring you up to speed on everything, all the big headlines from the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last seven days. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm thinking about my kind of gaming habits. Now, I must admit, I am a bit partial to like a a modern AAA game. You know, I'll play the Halos and the Call of Duties and stuff like that. But if I'm not playing on my old retro systems, generally there's a really good middle ground. And I'm thinking of games that, you know, I've been playing over the last kind of decade. I mean, you know, games like Shovel Knight and Fez and even stuff like Super Meat Boy. This kind of industry that's popped up, these kind of independent indie retro games, such a big market right now, isn't it? Yeah, I love kind of when people revisit older titles, but then they kind of add a modern twist or, or they kind of update it. And I love it when it's, uh, you know, a lot of the original developers as well, or they're kind of referencing stuff from the past. Um, one that I've been looking at is uh, Pioneers of Pagonia, which is um, a Settlers kind of remake made by the original a developer of the settlers and man yeah this looks really cool like there's been so many settlers games that have come out in the past but this one looks like a real kind of tribute to the settlers but also having that vibe of the new modern indie title yeah i mean i i i've been loving the indie titles i mean one of my favorite games kind of like you know of this subgenre, which is one that dan just mentioned is shovel knight and i'm a I've said mm. it before an absolute sucker for like retro indie games you know like new retro um, so, you know, we actually mentioned last week, um, there's a few new games coming out from Puppet Combo uh, on New Star Torture Video. And um, I actually been playing Bloodwash this week, which is a PS1 style horror game, which I finished last night, which made me jump out of my skin quite a few times. And then I've got another one tonight called Unmetal to play, uh, which is a Metal Gear Solid parody, but like, you know, with like 16 bit graphics. So you know there's a lot of them out there at the moment a hell of a lot of them on steam quite a few on like you know xbox and playstation as well but that leads really nicely into this week's guest uh, which is vic flug who is actually the founder and director of wormwood studios who you know have been behind some you know their indie retro titles but they've gone on to be really popular such as uh, primodia strange land which you know had really really high acclaim and you know kind of based on that kind of like classic point and click adventure but really kind of like with dark art artwork and like horror themes to them you know and catching up with Vic about those you know those games and his love for them is really cool and then he's also got a new one coming out which is currently on his kickstarter um which is called which is called <laughs> Joe always struggles with this one don't you Hibernac- Hibernaculum Hibernaculum which is called Hibernaculum which takes a little bit of a different you know turn from what he's known for um, and is actually a dungeon crawler, you know, kind of like an Eye of the Beholder kind of vein, but it's very reminiscent of like Alien and uh, and Dead Space. And we kind of talked to him about his influences and his love of that. And, and how beautiful the oh, pixel art is. It's yeah. absolutely stunning on this. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Vic's been a one-man army on this game. And, you know, the work that he's putting into it so far is just absolutely stunning. So it's really interesting, you know, interview kind of hearing about his history and, you know, where he's at now with the game. So really, really fun one. I love as well that a lot of these kind of indie developers are bringing back kind of forgotten genres like, you know, Dungeon Crawlers seem Mm. to be having a resurgence right now. You know, we we did an episode with the guys from Wadja Eye Games last year. Um, Even stuff like Shakedown Hawaii that I remember covering very early on on this podcast. And and like Point and Clicks as well. We've started to see a lot of Point and Clicks come back, which is uh, really nice to see. 
Yeah, so I'm um, going to be a really interesting one. I know you guys had to get up ridiculously early in the morning because uh, <laughs> Vic is based in Australia. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate the uh, the 6 a.m. alarm that you guys had today uh, to chat to Vic. But this is going to be a really interesting chat uh, going inside the world of uh, making modern retro indie games and that kind of scene. It's going to be a really good chat with Vic Flug, our special guest from Wormwood Studios. He's coming up in around half an hour from now. Now, we're also going to be catching up with uh, Peter Lee, the nostalgia nerd, about his uh, incredible new arcade bar that he's launching in just a bit as well. But before we do that, um, let's catch up on what's been happening in the world of retro from over the last week. Now, even though, when did the Giga League happen? I've got a feeling that was about, what, three years ago now? Oh, man. Yeah, it must have been must have been three years ago and like it just feels like every single week something from the giga leak is discovered but this is if, if, if you don't know what the giga leak is it's a it's a leak of lots and lots of nintendo uh, kind of <laughs> information that came out and people have been trawling for it for a very long time because uh it was quite huge but so many kind of announcements have come out of there and uh little things have been found and uh this is an interesting one yeah, so this is this. Well, this is I think more than interesting. You know, a lot of people are saying like this is going to go down in history, and this has actually been kind of discovered and released at the point of recording today. Um, so mm. obviously, Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo, such an iconic and huge game for Nintendo, an iconic game for the world, um, and a prototype map has been discovered as part of the Giga Link, um, which was a, a corrupted file from 1989, uh, which a user has managed to essentially. He's, you know, kind of put all the graphics back in there and uncorrupted it. And it turns out there's a very, very, very early build of a Super Mario World in there um, of like the kind of like the overhead map, you know, which is, you know, sat on Yoshi's so, Island. So it's not a level. It's the kind it's of... It's not a level. It's it's a, it's a world. It's a map. So, you know, in Super Mario Brothers 3 for the Nintendo, how you had like the eight worlds and you had the over, the over, the, like the overhead map and you'd move around yeah. and pick your level on Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo, it was very similar, but it was one big map, wasn't it? With like Donut Isles and Vanilla Land and I think it was the Forest of Illusion it was called and stuff like that. Um, And you start on, you know, Yoshi's Island and you move around the whole map. It's an early build of that, which looks very similar to Super Mario Brothers 3, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like Mm. an in-between, obviously, when when it was in early development, you know, probably, I think, two years before the game was actually completed and came out. I was going to say, Mario Bros. 3 was 89, wasn't yeah. it? So, yeah, what, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, by this point, they're obviously already working in Super Mario World. Um, but it, it's just, you know, I, I mean, it's crazy that they've discovered this and it's crazy that, you know, I mean, I'm sure Nintendo have tried to pull all of us down, but, <laughs> you know, it's out there and it's, it's crazy. And they've said, you know, the guys who have got a hold of this, so it's, uh, it's a researcher called Codfish, uh 1002 and he said that they have tried to go into the levels because there is levels on this map but there's nothing in there unfortunately so it is just right. kind of like everybody's saying it's a level but it's so it's a world it's kind of like the world view of the game if that makes sense yeah so you'd land on the squares and then you would go into the actual yes. levels yeah and then you'd the go into the on here levels as well. yeah but um yeah they, they're not playable there's nothing in there unfortunately but still very very cool Yeah, I mean, it's always interesting to see just kind of prototype builds. And I mean, to me, that is the real interest in the Giga League. I mean, Mm. it's not the fact that, you know, that there's finished games and you can see the source. I think I do find that kind of interesting. To me, it's more seeing what we didn't get. Yeah. Even though it's very naughty, we shouldn't look at it and it's highly illegal. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I I always like seeing like the, you know, the kind of, you know, of the prototypes, the in-between world, because it's, 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 Mm. you know, they've got a lot of assets there from, you know, the Nintendo games, but then it's cool to see what actually made it into the final game, you know, so the only real recognisable thing on there is actually the trees with the eyes on. I don't know if you remember that in the background of the of Super Mario World on the world map, you could see these little like round green trees and they all had eyes on yeah. them and they're on there in the game. And that seems like it's the only thing in this prototype that actually made it across in the end, which is really interesting. Because to me, I mean, you're right that this was kind of that halfway point between Mario Brothers 3 and Mario Super Mario World. Mm. Uh, because to me, I mean, I, I haven't played Super Mario World for a while, and maybe mm. in my mind I'm kind of, the graphics look better than they actually did. But to me, this looks very NES. Yeah, you know what? The, graphic style. The, the colour palette of this looks very Super Nintendo, but the style of it does remind me of the NES games. And, yeah. I, and maybe your mind isn't tricking you because of... Super Mario World, in my opinion, does look a little bit better than this. And I play, I play Super Mario World probably every every other year. And I think this mm. looks Super Mario World, the final product, the kind of like style of it, does look better than this prototype that's been discovered. 
It is awesome, though. Uh, uh, there's a lot of comments here. People going, right, I'll be remaking this in uh, Mario Maker this weekend. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, <laughs> that is one thing that I'm sure it will be available to play, you know, even the world view, and um, people will make their own maps and stuff, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, very interesting to see. And uh, like we said, you know, we don't necessarily approve of how this got out there. But we're glad that it did. So, you know, the Giga League, uh, the gift that keeps on giving, as we say. So if you want to check that out, I'll put a link to that story in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, winding back to Saturday mornings, back in the 90s, this might be something that rings a bell. Joe's rocking. I am rocking. <laughs> Bunk. Toxic Crusaders, what a show. Now, I remember watching this with my brother. It was a weird time because it was around that time in the early 90s when they were trying to, they were doing a lot of these kind of environmentally aware well, it was, kids it was, cartoons. It was like, also the kids one, wasn't it? So, like, they had Toxic Avenger before, which was yeah. a very mm. kind of I'm, hardcore I'm movie. I'm so glad you're aware of that, Ravi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a very, very um, kind of uh, some of the stuff in there probably wouldn't be allowed nowadays, and it's pretty sketchy. Um, but it was like a kind of culty B movie, mad sci fi kind of <laughs> film. And then they were like, right, let's make a, a kind of kids' version as well, because obviously you wouldn't be able to show kids that. But um, yeah, it was it was a really uh, kind of mad film. Um, I don't know if I recommend it or not. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, do Toxic yeah. Avengers and Crusaders have anything to do with each other? Or so, is it, I, I've got to f- so, so pretty much you've got Toxic Avenger. <clears throat> that I think there was, I think there was quite a few of them in the end. I was going to say there was three of them, but it was probably more than that. Mm. Which, as as Ravi says, is a really violent, you know, cheesy but kind of you know, but funny. You know, it's aware yeah. of what it is. A B movie from the I think the mid '80s, which was made by yeah. Troma you know, who own Toxic Crusaders and Toxic Avenger and everything. And they made low, mm. they're still going now, Troma Productions are, and they've made so yeah, many like... It was like Splatterhouse kind of cartoony. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, style. Yeah, yeah really but, but over the top, like yeah. classic new, class of Newcomb High and all those kind of films. But yeah, as, as you said, Dan, there was that very kind of like environmental, you know, friendly TV shows that came out, like following kind of like Captain Planet and stuff. And also yeah, random, really. randomly Troma made this, children's tv show and called it the toxic crusaders and it's just the characters well it's just tox toxie who's the main character you know the green one with the mop he is the toxic avenger from the films so that's the only real right. connection you know yeah it's, and it, it's like a kind of watered down loosely connected yeah, uh, yeah it's loosely connected thing. yeah yeah and you know he's he's a superhero who cleans up the streets with his mop in the film and in the and in the uh in the TV show, the children's TV show, it's the same thing. It's just, it's a kid's TV show, you know, from the nineties and they made up all these extra characters and stuff. And it was, I think it was off the vein, you know, off the back of like, you know, turtles and stuff like that, Ninja Turtles. Um, but yeah, they went for that environmental friendly kind of like, you know, cleaning up the toxic waste, didn't they with it? Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, like anything back then, I mean, Captain Planet got a video game, you know, I used to play that on the Amiga, even though it's generally regarded as an awful game. <laughs> I loved it because it was one of the first Amiga games I played. I do remember there being a Toxic Crusaders game on the Mega Drive yeah. as well. I remember my friend having that. Yeah, I've got that. And uh, it's a side along beat em up, like two player. Um, and then, you know, not the best game. And there's a couple of other, like there's a Game Boy one and Nintendo one, which AVGN has covered. You know, they weren't the best games. Um, but Retroware, uh, speaking of <laughs> AVGN and, you know, Retroware, they actually were responsible for making the Angry Video Game Nerd games. They are releasing in late 2023 the Toxic Crusaders beat 'em up game, which was announced earlier this week. Which it looks just seems um, mental. <laughs> it looks in the style of uh, the Turtles one and, and yeah. the Simpsons kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Arcade. Title. A bit Streets of Rage four as well. I mean, it's got kind of got that modern two D retro style. You know, quite high high resolution. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I've loved these games recently. Yeah, same. Um, and I know you have as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm an absolute sucker for this. You know, obviously we got Shredder's Revenge uh, a couple of months ago and, you know, mm. we got the remaster of all the Turtles games as well, the Cowabunga Collection and, as you say, Streets of Rage 4, which is actually three years old now. I don't You're know right, where the last though, three years have gone. But it is a weird choice. It is. Like, you know, <laughs> you'd think the other ones are, are kind of like, oh, yeah, we'll do that, definitely. They're, they're, they're much higher brands. Yeah. But, like, you know, even this, like, I was a bit older so i wasn't really watching the cartoon and stuff i vaguely remember it. i don't remember any of the 
supporting characters or, <laughs> or anything like that. The you supporting know, um, cast. <laughs> it's probably just the the theme song, but um, yeah, it's a it's a weird choice, isn't it? Like, it, it it's well, I was going to talk about that, and I, and and this is just my theory, my speculation. But so the Toxic Crusaders, there was only ever like twelve episodes of it. There was only ever one season of it, and. There was one toy line with like ten toys, so it never it never took off like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles did, or even Captain Planet. It was never that big, but it's obviously a bit of a cult classic. Like you know, me and Dan remember it, and you vaguely remember it, Ravi. But it was a bit of a cult classic, and it seems like a really odd game for them to for Retroware to kind of develop and get into. But my my theory is Retroware are behind the angry video game nerd games, um, so they obviously have a relationship with James Rolfe. James Rolfe has a relationship with um, Lloyd Kaufman, who is the owner of Troma, the production studio oh, who, right. own, okay, okay. who own Toxic Crusaders, who invented Toxie and the Toxic Crusaders. So I wonder if there's a connection there or if he put them in touch or, you know. I thought or, you were going to say he hangs around rubbish dumps. He hangs around rubbish dumps. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, AVGN is the Toxic Crusader. No, nothing like that. But um, Neil Kaufman was actually on the Toxic Crusaders AVGN episode and, He's been on their podcast when they were doing the podcast and he's been on like when they've done, he's done a few episodes of like of quite a few collaborations with James Rolfe. Um, and yeah. he's a real, you know, he's an older guy now. I think he's in his late seventies or mid seventies. And he, but he's, he's so hands on with like the indie scene because he is indie scene like it's, through and through. So I wonder if there's some sort of connection there that's been, you it know, reminds put me of the uh, garbage pail kids one that came yeah, out recently yeah. as well and we were like that's a bit odd but um, yeah, maybe there's a, more association in america as well with these yeah uh, maybe 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 brands. it's a little bit more of a you know a, i mean it's a bit of a cult classic here but maybe it is in america as well but i certainly will be buying it because i'm a sucker for these beat em ups and it's going to be on everything playstation 4 playstation 5 xbox switch steam um and it's going to be four player co-op which you know nice. i'm just a sucker for so really looking forward to this one yeah, and it's also going to have all the stuff you expect. It says a, a stunning soundtrack that will make you party like it's 1991. Apparently there's going to be comic book cutscenes in there as well. Um, you know, fully voiced, seven playable characters, all with their own special unique moves and combos as well. So, I mean, it kind of feels like, I mean, there has been a lot of these kind of side-scrolling multiplayer beat-em-ups coming out in, in recent months. I mean, you talked about Shredder's Revenge, Final Vendetta. They came out of the back end of last oh, year as yeah, well. Yeah. But to me, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the indie scene bringing back these game genres. And I'm loving these because, I mean, these were just such a big part of my childhood, these kind of side-scrolling fighting fighting games. So mm. the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. So this looks like something I like, I like to get my hands on. Apparently it's only going to be 24 99 which, you know, I think is a pretty good deal. Yeah, pretty good so, deal. Um, um, fingers crossed it comes straight to Xbox as well. You, you never know with these things are Game Pass. But yeah, looking forward to this one. Yeah, so it's a, you can wishlist it on Steam right now and apparently coming out late 2023 um, on the consoles as well. So if you want to read more about that, I'll, uh, I'll put the trailer and the screenshot so far in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, we have got something really cool to talk about in just a moment from Atari. A bit of a first from them. Before we do that, though, I mean, you know, talking about being retro gaming fans... It all kind of goes back to the arcades, doesn't it? And that's where we all started. And we love visiting arcades. And as far as I'm concerned, the more arcades that pop up around the country, the better. Particularly when you hear who is behind this brand new bar arcade that's going to be opening in Norwich very soon. So we thought to uh, to talk a bit more about it, we'll get on one of the guys who's behind it. And it's a very good friend of the show, Peter Lee, the Nostalgia Nerd. How's it going, Peter? Hello, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. Now, um, you did kind of touch on this when um, we had a catch you up a couple of months ago, mm. that you had an exciting new project on the way. I mean, before we get into this, I mean, kind of j- just how big of an arcade fan are you? I mean, going back to your childhood, what, what kind of arcade memories have you got? Oh God, I mean, h- huge arcade fan. So I grew up in a Norfolk seaside town called Cromer. And, you know, there was four, no, five arcades there when I was younger. So literally my entire weekend would just be going round from arcade to arcade and checking out the machines. You know, they had Chase HQ, Robocop, Turtles. And it was just, I, I used to scrape together like a pound's worth of 10 P's and just go down there and have a blast. And that, that was where me and my mates would hang out. So it's critically important to me. Yeah, because it did feel like arcades kind of vanished for a while, but now it seems like they're coming back bigger than ever in many ways. And um, you've got a great group. I mean, you know, we were talking before we started recording that, you know, Norwich just seemed to be like one of the go-to places in the UK for retro gaming right now. So tell us about this um, 
new bar arcade then that you're opening in Norwich? Because this is running on Kickstarter right now, isn't it? So give us kind of the background on this. What's happening? Yeah, so basically um, when, when I got a, I moved into my office in Norwich, there was a, a cafe down below called Slice and Dice and it was ran by uh, Samantha Whitehouse. I got talking to her and it turned out she had like a passion to open up an arcade bar. And I was like, well, that's funny because I do as well. So time went on and we found um, a premises in Norwich. It's the old Prince of Wales pub, which is, is, it's been shut down for like four or five years, but it's traditionally like a football pub and it is, it's not had a great time. And it just seemed like the perfect venue to host a load of arcade machines. So we went down there, checked it out, realized we could, you know, we could sort out the decorating and get everything up to speed, source some arcade machines. And, we, you know, we're now at a point where we just need a little bit more funding. We, we've got most of it just to kind of push it over and get these arcade machines in and create this amazing arcade bar, which is, you know, a, a passion project for both of us, I think. Well, I, I think board game cafes have been really popular you know I've, I've seen them all over the cities and i've not seen that many arcades kind of popping up like everybody had a different experience of the arcades are you going to try and like, represent the different periods of time yeah so, so slice and dice was a is a board game cafe and that's for the cafe sam runs so we're gonna we're, we're basically looking for a cross section from the early 80s we're starting up until about 2005 so we're covering a good range of machines so we're going to have all the classics like Pac-Man, Space Invaders, you know, uh, Qbert, but then machines which are a bit more obscure, like Ferrari F three five five Challenge, which is arguably superior to Outrun two. That's up for debate, but it's you Ooh, know, controversy, yeah, controversial. <laughs> but it's a decent machine, um, you know. Just, just all basically, we want to concentrate on machines which are fun rather than just classics. So. Classic machines, which are also, you know, track and field, that sort of thing, which are just really fun to play, especially multiplayer. That sounds fantastic. And obviously you've got yourself behind it, but who else is involved with the project? Uh, so Samantha Whitehouse, who ran the cafe below my office, is going to be running it with me. But we've also got uh, Stuart Ashen is involved in the project as well. And uh, Daz from Did You Know Gaming and the Spriters Resource. So they're kind of there to provide some investment and to help us along um, and, you know, I think together we're a pretty good team to get this place up and running. Well, you've also got a bit of knowledge about the uh, machines as well. Are you going to have like somebody that's going to go and repair them and kind of maintain them? Because I've been to a few arcades and some of the machines were working and broken. And that's always a bit of a frustrating thing and trying to keep these yeah. kind of older ones alive. Yeah, it really is. So um, we uh, are you, have been speaking to um, Andy from Play Expo and he's kind of got, obviously he goes around doing these expos with loads of machines, but he's going to be renting us out a load of machines and offering like on-site support as well. So if there's something does go wrong, you know, we can get someone out rapidly to fix it. And then obviously if it's like a minor problem, I can fix it on the spot as well. Uh, so we should be covered on all grounds. We definitely don't want a situation where we've got to stick a, piece of paper on the screen and be like oh this is out of order for a week because if someone's coming to play a specific machine that's just pants isn't it that's not what you and, want and andy's mm. involved with pixel bunker i think as well which is another arcade so he's, he's got the experience definitely yeah i went up to see him in blackpool the other week and i went into his uh arcade sort of it's like a i don't know what you call it it's like it's like it's not a kind of graveyard because these machines are being repaired but there's all half battered and like machines arcade in hospital yeah arcade <laughs> hospital yeah <laughs> it's just amazing <laughs> to see it's just machines crammed into every nook and cranny and it was just a matter of like going around and being like okay we'll have that we'll have this one this one can be repaired and it's just nice to see these machines getting you know brought back to life so that we can stick them for people to use so I uh, read on the Kickstarter page about one of my favourite things of all time, food. Tell us what's on the menu. So on the menu, um, me being a vegan, it is all going to be plant-based vegan food. Oh yeah, but, lovely stuff. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's bloody great. So um, we're, basically we're going to be concentrating on vegan junk food. So yeah. we're going to have loads of massive trays of loaded fries of all sorts oh, of different yeah. toppings. Are you, are you going mad on the seaton? That's the... Uh... That's well, the kind Satan, of vegan, yeah. vegan say, Satan or Satan. I never know how to say it. <laughs> so we'll be having like a combination of different toppings. So there will be Satan, there'll be like tofu, there'll be various 
meat alternatives, which are mm. pretty indistinguishable from the real thing. So, Saucy chips. That's right up my street. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Big old trays as well. I think, I think the only problem is making sure that people don't eat a handful of greasy chips and then go straight to the machines and just start playing. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Lots of hand sanitizer around the room. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like a wash station between the food and the and the machines. You know, I remember being a kid as well and going to Seaside Arcades and they'd all have like kind of different themes and everything. And obviously, you know, you guys are all very nostalgic for that era too. One thing I'd say is arcades do feel a little bit more classy these days. I remember, you know, back then they'd stink of mainly body odor, body odor and uh, stale <laughs> cigarettes and stuff back in the day. What kind of theme are you going for then? Because you, you're doing something quite special with the space, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, so I mean, I would love to recreate the smoky body odor sensations of the past, but I think we're going for more of a kind of something that hasn't really been done. So we're kind of going to put like plants everywhere and combine it mm. with the arcade machines. So it's going to be l- lighter than your typical fare of arcade. You know, if you go to like NQ64 or something like that in London, it's very dark and that's a particular vibe, but we're going for kind of the other end where there's plants everywhere. So you feel like you're in a kind of jungle with the arcade machines, but like a, a classy jungle. I don't, you know, I, I, I think it's something you'd have to experience rather than me describing because I'm probably describing it as quite poorly. Well, you have got a great video on the Kickstarter page where people can get a bit of a vibe of um, yeah. you know what you guys are working on right now. And at the time of recording, I mean, you're almost uh, half of the way there. I mean, it ends on um, April the 10th. So, I mean, you know, for people that want to back it on Kickstarter, what, what kind of rewards and stuff are you offering on that? So we've got a range of rewards. We've got like, you can get your name on the wall. Um, you can get onto our exclusive Discord server where we're, we're going to post updates from me and Ashens and Daz. Um, and you can get various membership packs as well, So, which will offer you 10% off tokens and food and drink or higher membership packs, which will offer you loads of tokens to use on the machines. And you can even hire out the entire venue if you want for the top tier at a, at a very reasonable price, I might add, because mm. it will cost us a lot more to close it for that night. Well, I think it's awesome. And I love the fact that you're doing, you know, crowdfunding this part of it. Because like you said, I mean, you've had to lay out for all the arcade machines and everything anyway. But it kind of gives it a bit more of a community feel, I think, you know, that people can get involved in it too. So yeah, running on Kickstarter right now until um, Monday, April 10th. So I'll put a link in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Um, make this a reality. You know, we can't have too many arcades, I don't think, Peter. No, and I think, you know, you, you guys are definitely the right ones to do one, I think. so. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be great. As, you know, as long as we can meet our target, then things are looking good. And um, um, you know, we thought by offering the outs of people, it, it get them involved. It feels like the sort of best thing to do for, you know, us as a collection of YouTubers. Yeah, well, best of luck. I'm, I've got, you know, no doubts at all that you're going to smash it. So um, I'll put a link so people can get involved in our show notes as well. Good luck with it, Pete. We look forward to coming along when it's open. Thank you, you very you much. all your chips. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can have free chips, you know, it's fine. <laughs> Cheers, Pete. Thank you. Now, it does seem like a lot of games are getting remastered and um, remade recently, getting, you know, nice upgrades for modern gen consoles and computers. Now, this is a game called Little Big Adventure. Now, were you guys, there's two of these games back in the day. Did you play them? Yes. I've, n- <laughs> I've never played them. I, I remember seeing the guy in the blue outfit with like the ponytail everywhere. And my, mm. my missus a couple of years ago was like, what's this game? And she showed it me because she was like, because me and my sister used to play this all the time on PC. And I was like, oh, it's Little Big Adventure. And she was like, oh, you must have loved it. I was like, I've never played it. So tell me about it, Ravi. <laughs> well, this came out in 1994 originally, didn't it? Yeah, so Little Big Adventure came out. It came out later on consoles, but like, it was big on the PC when DirectX came out. So um, CD-ROM uh, was just like, you know, kind of getting popular. DirectX as well, and that kind of extra like graphic fidelity that you had. Uh, and... It was such a good title. Like Little Big Adventure was absolutely amazing. Uh, it was in this kind of like isometric world. Um, it reminds me a bit of Degeneration. Um, yeah, the kind of side on view. Yes, but also like yeah. the attack. So you'd have different modes. Um, so you'd have this orb. That's how you kind of attack people. Um, but you'd have to go into each mode. So you'd like, you know, you go into fighting mode, you go into this. And it and it was a very kind of puzzle-based, but also you had to, like in Degeneration, get through certain sections and stuff. It was quite clunky. It was um, not the best graphics, but it had this certain, like, beauty to it, the original one. And um, I absolutely loved that. And then the second one came out, uh, Little Big Adventure 2, which... which um, 
the little blue guy that you're on about is called Twin Sen. He was the kind of main character for it. But um, okay. the, the second one had a bit more of a free roam element with it. It had um, stuff like uh, full motion video and stuff. But the second one only came out on the PC. So the original one came out, um, you know, it got PC release and then onto PlayStation and stuff like that. But um, the second version only ever came out on the PC. And it, it was a really good title. Obviously, they, they they'd improved stuff. It was it was a bit different. Um, as it later went on, it, it, it kind of lost me in the series. But originally, that first one was just like, what is this? And also the kind of whole fantasy behind the world. It felt like uh, a very different world. It felt kind of like, a f- not Fantasia, but it had this kind of um, just really good fantasy background it's a medieval it. kind of theme is it kind of, yeah, kind of it, it, yeah you know it reminds me weirdly of the crystal maze <laughs> when you're playing it because you've got puzzles and you've got different areas and uh but then also like other games like skies of arcadia and stuff like that it's got that kind of like rpg element and it and it has a, a kind of it's weird to explain like a family friendly kind of fun you know a lot of the uh, enemies were like elephants and stuff like this it had this kind of a, a very different vibe to to games that were coming out at the time which were a lot of like you know first person shooters and stuff like that so uh i really appreciated it but this one looks like it's um actually getting remastered and they've changed the name as well so there's been quite a few um kind of attempts to remaster it people have said you know uh we're, we're gonna do little big adventure free reboot um there's also been announcements that have come out and people have gone mad. And, um, you know, it looks like, I don't know, maybe they don't have the rights for it or I'm not sure why they've called it Twin Sends. Yeah. These these remasters. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that I hate the graphics on them completely. I think, right. I've, you know, some people love these shader graphics. They love these updates and stuff like that. For me personally... I love to see like a 4K version with the old style, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, the old pixel art just of scale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is the new kind of modern shader stuff, um, and it doesn't really appeal to me. Uh, it looks a lot more cartoony than the original. Yeah, it does, and I think I think they're trying to attract a new audience as well because th- this is also going on to console as well. So um, it's probably going to be the first time that. I, don't quote me on that, but uh, the first time that Little Big Adventure Two would have gone onto a console, uh, w- which is interesting. So maybe they're trying to attract that new, you know, new group of people that are playing stuff on the Switch or playing on uh, new consoles and try and get them like wrapped into into the world before they release the uh, third one. Well, I've looked a bit into that name for you. Apparently, yeah, Little Big Adventure Two came out in 1997, published by um, Electronic Arts. And then apparently it was later re-released by Activision uh, in North America, okay. but they renamed the game to Twinson's Odyssey in America. I never knew that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> that could explain the name, I guess. You're kind of getting both audiences there, the American and the British audience, I guess, or, or the European audiences. Um, I think you might have put Joe off it for life by saying it was a bit like Degeneration, though, because we made Joe play Degeneration on the After Hours <laughs> podcast, and I think he still has nightmares about that game now, don't you? <laughs> I do a little bit. I don't know. I like the look of it, but I I don't want to – I'm not going to say I agree with Ravi and say I hate the art style, but I would in, – in this instance, I would have liked to have seen – the original art style again like looking at yeah. it but i think this is the one i'm gonna to have to go back and play because my missus always that's how he always goes on about it she's mentioned it quite a few times so i, th- I need to check this mm. out well it's interesting because i are saying that they've updated the camera angles which was obviously always an issue with those like early games the way that the camera followed it and the, the camera angles but also revamp the controls and the soundtrack which was just epic like really good and they've got a new version of that as well so they're doing it in a HD version. So I guess that's going to be a total update of like instruments and stuff like that and have a lot more definition with the sound. And that I'm really looking forward to. To be honest, I might even just buy it for the soundtrack if it comes yeah. in a in a in a in a way that I can kind of just play it as a as a separate thing. Yeah, so apparently it's coming out on a PC and uh, consoles, it says. It doesn't specify which ones, but I 
I take it, you know, probably the usual ones. Um, in 2024, so if you want to see the uh, screenshots of that so far, um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Now, this is really interesting. I must admit, I know uh, Joe and I have both got um, MetaQuest 2 headsets, virtual reality headsets. Mine kind of gathered dust for quite a while because, I mean, there are some games that I like on there. But then, I mean, you know, if you try and go into the uh, the Metaverse as it's called. I saw a scathing article over the weekend about, you know, what kind of a wasteland it is and how Mark Zuckerberg has wasted billions on something that no one's actually using. Billions, but really, uh, billions of people have wasted billions on it. I think there's so many companies that invested. It's like the new crypto, isn't it? <laughs> Even in terms of sales as well. I mean, sales have been, I think Mark Zuckerberg wanted something like a billion users apparently by this time, by mid-2023. And I've got a feeling they've sold something like 10 million I've headsets. I've got to say, so. I've I sold all my VR stuff because it yeah. just feels uncomfortable to me and I can't sit in it for long periods of time. It just doesn't feel there. Yeah. And yeah, I ended up like, I, I jumped on it when it first came and now I'm kind of like, Meh. you know, but I know some people that really love it. So, And there are some good games on there. I mean, to me, that is really what it is. I mean, it, it's a gaming platform and, you know, there's a couple of kind of retro VR games that I've bought on there. I've got Col- Colossal Cave 3D. Uh, by Ken and Roberta Williams that I bought over the weekend. Oh, cool. So looking forward to having a bit of a play of that this weekend too. But really, if we're talking old school gaming, I mean, you know, it doesn't come much more old school than Atari, does it? And apparently Atari are now getting involved in virtual reality. Yeah, so they've done their consoles and now they're kind of uh, uh, releasing a VR title. And interestingly, this title is a... Uh, it's kind of like one of these old school themed ones, but we've seen other titles like this where people are sitting in a room and they're or they're in a like retro arcade and they're they're kind of playing around all i can see is trailer for this at the moment and uh it seems that you're in a room and you've got different ways of playing your devices you've got a collection of obviously old atari consoles as well um which might not appeal to some retro collectors who already have them and can sit and physically do that anyway but uh, it looks like it's got an interesting interface. Uh, there's some cool little ideas, and you can actually go inside some of the games as well. Um, I, I think it's cool to see that Atari is still focusing on their kind of, uh, you know, producing new stuff, um, but with some of their older brands, like, put into there as well. Well, this look it's part of the Pixel Rip series. So, I mean, we've talked about this before, haven't we? There was a Pixel Ripped 1989, and I've got Pixel Ripped 95, um, on the quest and really what these are I mean yeah the, the kind of you know period pieces in terms of your way your virtual reality headset uh, Pixel Rip 95 you kind of set, sat in your 1990s living room looking at your 90s TV while your mum with a 90s hairstyle is in the room and you know you look outside and your friends in the window while you're playing games and stuff as well so what a lot of these are I mean they're basically just um, emulation packages of systems from that era wrapped up in this kind of world that feels like the time period that the the games are from. Um, interesting that Atari behind this one, which makes sense. I mean, I think, um, I'm not sure who, it was a company called um, Arvor, who are behind the other two. So I'm not sure whether Atari have took this in-house or whether they're working with Arvor. Yeah, look, it looks like actually Arvor are working with Atari, but have actually licensed their games to put in this by the sense well, of it. It looks a bit more than kind of just sitting in the room because... Um They've, they've got Crystal Castles in there. They've got, like, Yars Revenge and stuff. And y- you actually have this, like, controller on your arm, like, uh, you know, a Pip-Boy or, or something like that. And yeah. and you go into the games, but also it says repair old Atari games as well. So you're going in there <laughs> and you're physically fixing Yars Revenge. Or like, Is there a virtual soldering iron in here? <laughs> no, this <laughs> kind of thing on your arm becomes your, your repair device and... Uh, yeah, so you can kind of jump in the game, fix it up a bit. I don't know, maybe you could customise it to a degree. It is a cool idea. I don't know if you've got any of these, Joe, because I know you've got a VR headset. Have you got any I, of these I, I'm, collections? You know what? A few people sent me these as well, like to play, you know, because of when I got my MetaQuest, I was like, oh, yeah, give me your recommendations. I played Resident Evil 4. That is all I played on it. Played it yeah. for like two months for every night, and now I hate to say it, and I really hate this, but yeah, mine's just like... <laughs> in its box gathering dust as well i don't want to say i told you so yeah you did I told you, so. you did and you asked me <laughs> you asked me after i got it like a few, after a few weeks you're like do you still play it i was like every night i love it i can't see myself yeah, going back I to did. normal games yeah 
Yeah, that's exactly what I've, I was like that with PlayStation VR. I was like that when I got my Oculus as well. I mean, I'm still kind of eyeing up a PSVR 2. I, I did, I did Beat Saber once and then I was like, this is too much. My heart can't take it. <laughs> I need to sit down. <laughs> Yeah, I, but I do like these collections. I mean, because I mean, really, that's what they are—that they're emulators. Um, but I think it is cool that they kind of put you in the world as well. And there's a bit of extra stuff in there, like you know, I'm looking at the trolley here for the uh, the 19 the Atari 1979 one. It kind of you know, you've, you've got your Atari VCS in front of you. You have to put the cartridge in, so it does become a bit more of an experience. So I think it is quite a nice way to present these. Um, Pixel Rip 1978 it is actually so um, expecting that very soon so if you want to uh, read more about that I'll put a link to that and everything else we talk about and the uh, the full trailer in our show notes and everything else you'll find them all at the retrohour.com now of course I can't believe that it is the end of March already so that means this weekend being the last Sunday of the month it is going to be our patrons hangout now this is something that we do last Sunday of every month we invite all our patrons to come on and basically completely nerd out with us talk about anything you want old school video games classic movies that often pops up as well we talk about music really to me i mean because you know i always remember reading about like user groups and stuff back in the day and i'm a member of some user groups today I go to your uh robin hood amiga user group ravi in real life but to me being able to attend basically a user group meeting in my pajamas from home once a month Without having to leave the house, I think it's incredible. I, That's kind I of haven't the vibe seen we you have. in pajamas on it yet, but yeah. Well, you don't see the <laughs> maybe you don't see below the waist, Revy. <laughs> his, his super tad pajamas. Um, <laughs> I, I I absolutely love them. Yeah, they're really good. Uh, just to have a, a chat with everybody and you know find out what people have been doing, but also kind of discover a bit of technology. But um, the patrons also get an ad free episode, which is really awesome, and they get an after hours podcast as well which is our extra podcast and how many episodes have we done of that now joe oh god i think 33 of them now yeah you we're, know we're doing 33 this weekend 33 I think, this so. weekend yeah so if you, you know, sign up you, you you can get an rss feed which will be ad free and you'll also get all of those on there which is a, a pretty good amount of listening yes i mean the real reason that we have patreon though is just to make sure that we can keep the lights on because we know you know times are tough at the moment and um you know, even in terms of the advertising market in podcasting, we'll be honest, I mean, it's a very difficult time right now. And I've got to say, you know, without our patrons, we probably couldn't continue doing the show. It is that important to us. So we really appreciate any support that we get. And like uh, Ravi and Joe just said then, we have loads of perks, loads of rewards as well. If you'd like to join our patrons community, we have a little Discord that we're chatting all week as well that you'll get invited to. And um, you also get an extra 50 minutes or so on each week's podcast. We're going to keep the news stories going for another 15 minutes or so for our patrons in just a minute. So now is a very good time to sign up to our patrons community you can join the hangout this sunday night if you're a gold member or above you'll get a new episode of the after hours podcast and you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that it's thanks to you that the podcast can continue each week and of course new patrons always get inducted into the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming and that is the retro hour hall of fame hall of fame and let's give a massive welcome to our latest supporters a big thank you to jeremy graham Daniel Hall and Wes Carter who all joined us on Patreon over the last week or so we hugely appreciate your support and if you'd like to do the same you can sign up right now all the details are at theretrohour.com right then next going to be going inside the world of making modern indie retro games a world of dungeon crawlers as well with Vic from Wormwood Studios our special guest next on the Retro Hour podcast <laughs> You're listening to the Retro Hour, and we're here with our very special guest, Victor Flug. How are you doing, Victor? Uh, not too bad. How's it going, guys? All good. Very. Thank you very much. So, the first question we always ask one of our guests is, "What is your earliest gaming memory?" Okay, that, that's. A, I mean, that's obviously a great one. I kind of had to dredge the the ancient um, backlog of the brain there, but um, pretty much like I think my earliest gaming memory would be like Eagle's Nest, Alley Cat, and oh, yeah. kind of Game and Watch era stuff. Like um, yeah, I remember my my dad's friend Michael Line let me his computer a couple of games like yeah, Alley Alley's Cat and uh, Eagle's Nest, and like some kind of early predecessor to Dune Battle for Arrakis. Uh, I forget the name, but it was like the literal grandfather of the RTS genre. I don't think many people talk about that one now, now much, but uh, yeah. So pretty old school, I guess you could say. So uh, you grew up in um, 
Sweden, right? Uh, no, I grew then... up in Australia. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a Swiss national and Australian national dual citizen. And uh, yeah, but grew up here in, in Melbourne, Australia. Although um, was apparently, that, um... apparently my accent isn't strong enough because a lot of people here in Australia are like, are you from America? And I'm like, no, you know, I just <laughs> spent time in Switzerland as well and, and then end up just, yeah. <laughs> Did you have much of a kind of arcade scene then when you were growing up? Were there, were there many machines around and uh, yeah, places? Yeah. Where so would you play them as like well? The local 7-Eleven or Severs, as we call it, is um, in Melbourne had like Street Fighter cabinets, Mortal Kombat, that kind of thing. And that was, um, I mean, that was when I was actually making friends and just getting out of the sort of basement dwelling, playing Alley Cat at, you know, seven years old or whatever age I was then. <laughs> I don't think we could establish that, but yeah. Um, yeah, there was a decent arcade scene here in the Mel- in Melbourne back in the day. Um, I even remember, like, you know, there's, of course, you could rent VHS tapes at the video store back then, but mm-hmm. we had this tiny little shop in Garden Vale called, it was called Big Nez's Video Game Store, and Nez with a Z, and it was like a tiny video game rental store where you could rent consoles and systems. This was just as uh, Super Nintendo was coming out in Australia, so I assume 94 or something. We got it way after all of you in the UK and the, in, in America, I think. But um, yeah, I just, I just have these memories of this weird kind of creepy little video game store. I think the guy was selling drugs from there or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, just being this tiny kid and all these guys in sports jackets kind of lurking around, but just shelves of, of Nintendo, um, NES, Super Nintendo, and just like, uh, it was like heaven, um, literal heaven. Yeah. <laughs> um was it was were they actually renting the machines then yeah yeah they were renting the machines i mean we we couldn't afford a a super nintendo um i remember i had a nez that i actually swapped for a hong kong bootleg nez i had gotten on my way back from switzerland um so i had a nez around that time but it was like i was renting a super nintendo i was renting most of my games and um yeah they had some arcade (laughs) machines that are yeah big nez's video game rental emporium which is a tiny little hole in the wall in garden vale back in the 90s so um, did you have much interest in like, you know, like video game development or anything like that? Or did you kind of go straight into art? Because traditionally you're a painter, aren't you? Um, well, let me see. You know, I, I'd say my interests and skills range across multiple disciplines, really. But at, at the end of the day, I design and build kind of worlds like paintings mm. are part of that. Yeah. But I don't really see myself as as uh, just a painter, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So how, so what's, what's the story of you kind of getting into the video game industry? So, you know, you're in Australia, you're quite passionate about video games, you're renting Super Nintendos. <laughs> what, what's the kind of story there? So I guess like from like adolescence to adulthood, you know, what, yeah. what was kind of like your journey with like, you know, kind of like getting into development, I guess. Well, it did start out um, it, from the art side of things, doing concept art for, for smaller indie, um, indie studios, sort of, you know, in my late teens and early 20s mm. and stuff but pretty much that just led directly into starting primordia as my first step uh through the door of the industry and um yeah kind of never looked back since then i, I guess yeah what were your um kind of art influences then uh where were you like drawing inspiration from oh i mean oh that could that's pretty far ranging it would be you know everything from david lynch to delia derbyshire brian eno josh kirby oh wow uh, Theodore Sturgeon, um, Phil K. Dick. I'm um, sorry, I shouldn't put my hand in front of my face there. That's probably blocking the microphone. Um, yeah, a ton of speculative fiction from the 60s, or any, anyway, from like the 1940s to the 1980s, because we had a bunch of these old science fiction Hall of Fame books on the shelf and, uh, you know, not a lot in the way of video games. So, mm. you know, when I, when I um, completed Link to the Past, it was pretty much crack open a book at that point or play, you know, the new games at my friend's house and stuff. So, yeah. And, it, and it's kind of that, like, analog future kind of sci-fi yeah. vibe coming, yeah, coming from always, those um, names. Yeah, yeah I've always, uh, I mean, just had a really, I guess, analog kind of <laughs> analog feel to everything I do, really. I like, I like a hands-on, I like working hands-on with anything I create, really, and kind of removing the barriers between the creator and the creation i guess you could say yeah that's really cool so you know you founded worm you mentioned wormwood studios there in 2010 you founded mm-hmm. that with programmer mark yo is it yolam what's the story there so how did you guys kind of like come up with the concepts to start you know an indie studio because that's probably quite a big undertaking isn't it 
Mm, mm, yeah. Okay. So actually, Wormwood Studios came about as my attempt to create and lead an indie dev team myself. Um, okay. I put out a call for some help around, I think, six months into the production of Primordia. That's how I mm. found Mark. Um, I brought him on board to help with dialogue and puzzle design for Primordia. And yeah, pretty much ran from there. So what made you think like, right, Primordia 2010, I'm going to make a game. How does that kind of come about, you know? <laughs> um, uh, look, the original inception was, you know, I'd made some smaller games in an mm. AGS adventure game okay. studio creator. Um, I just wanted to make something slightly bigger as like, yeah, my, my foot into the door of the industry. But the first, the very first inception for Primordia came from um, a post that this, this nerd called rapper I was into at the time, Chris True. And he said, oh, for $50, you can, uh, I'll do a voice for, for whatever reason. I was like, well, you know, I'll take that, my love of floating robots, the apocalyptic mm. setting I've been building up in my game so far. I'll make a decent size uh, game this time. And um, I mean, it was called, I think, Robot Game was my working title at that point. But mm. yeah, pretty much um, went into pre-production and then production of Prime Audio. And then, yeah, I went from there. What what kind of um, software were you using on Prime Audio? Because it, it, it looks very like illustrated. Yeah. Um, so, how were you converting that to? Kind yeah. Of so that's stuff? um that's all down to Chris Jones's um, AGS engine or Adventure Game Studio engine. It's a fantastic little tool for uh, anywhere from like prototyping little adventure games to really getting down with the coding side of things and and um I mean obviously creating a full game like Primordia. Um, so that's sort of where I I guess you know got into making games is, is using AGS. But my my formula for the like the graphics music gameplay world development i guess is the main thing it's i mean there's a lot of different processes and there's there was a lot of drawing for the art there was a lot of machines involved with the sound back then and uh yeah it's just um the sum of more than its parts at the end of the day i guess yeah was that like done with a, a tablet or were you like sketching and then yeah scanning i had a, i had a really old school into us um tablet that my friend um trist um let me way back in the day that actually lasted all the way through Prime Audio, halfway through Strange Land, I've just upgraded to a pro version, and it's the worst thing I've ever used. So, um, <laughs> anyone out there looking okay, to back to the old one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or try one of these knockoffs, um, these these cheap eBay knockoffs, because that's what I'm going to try next. Actually, there's a you can get some decent cheap gear these days, and it seems like the name brands might be falling off a bit. So, yeah. I've seen the iPads are quite good. Um, yeah, uh, with some of the pen options. Oh, and, and a Cintiq. I mean, that that's the ultimate for for you know digital art. I've actually never drawn on a Cintiq myself. I get fine uh, buy fine with a Wacom. Well, less so lately, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Sorry, obviously, uh, I read that you were bit of a you're a bit of a one man army when it kind of comes to the game development. So with well, Prime yeah. Audio in 2012, what was kind of like what what were your roles? Talk us through everything you had to kind of do to get that game off the ground. Okay. Well, yeah, like I said, I mean, Primordia was my way to get the my foot in the door of the games industry, made a few projects up until then and just felt like I was ready to tackle a mid-sized game. Um, yeah, that's was just pretty much like, you know, I, I, I mean, I'd been a concept artist on a lot of other smaller indie dev projects up until that point, like I said, and I pretty much just saw nothing but sort of bad leadership. And I don't know, everyone works pretty much for free on indie game projects, right? So you've got to allow people working in your game a little bit of creative freedom like that. So I'd be on projects where the, the lead developer or the director, you know, in their first time game would get a bunch of artists working for free and then say, you have to paint exactly my vision on my game. And it's like, I wanted to do something different than that. I mean, I ended up painting other people's visions. I'm doing quote air quotes right now, but the vision would change. They'd never be happy with my work. I'd end up painting 40 things that I thought were fantastic, but they didn't somehow fit the game that they were going into, even though I'm working for free. So I was like, okay, this, this paradigm is ridiculous. Um, I'm going to do it differently. And I, you know, I guess that's where the idea for Wormwood Studio started is like, it, I could fall over myself and do better than, than a lot of these guys. And, and that's not to put down indie, de um, indie dev teams at all. Like I have some incredible peers out there that I've worked with and have seen working alongside us that are just, you know, continuing to do amazing things in the industry. So, yeah. It's it's always hard to kind of get that image or that vision from somebody's head and then recreate it, and sometimes it never matches. Like you know, when when they yeah. do like a a film of a book or something, and people are like, "Oh, that's not how I imagined it." <laughs> it's a, a tough process that must be. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Well, 
Oh, I was wondering how how did the um, world and the kind of game come to life, and um, so the world of how Primordial. did you create such a, a vast world? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I just sat down with a, a pencil and paper and some oil paints actually, and just started building it and took it from there pretty much. Uh, I mean, it did start with. Well, I was going to say start with painting, but it started with painting and music, world building. Um, I pretty much had, looking back at some of the old sketches, I think I had like all of the thumbnails for the world at the same time as I had the map of the world done. So it was like, it was a real sort of all at the same time world building process, you could say, I guess. So it's got a real beautiful, you know, art style. And it kind of reminds me of like Fallout. Uh, and I've wrote here meets mm. meets Mad Max in a sense, but Love you know, I, gu- I guess Fallout is kind of Mad Max. Was that kind of like the inspiration you were going for, or? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, being Australian or living in Australia most of my life, Australia, um, Mad Max <laughs> is obviously a huge inspiration. <laughs> Fallout was one of the games I hired as a kid. The original Fallout, hired from mm. a, a video store, not not Big Nez. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, they've just both been huge influences throughout my childhood and adult life now for better or worse, pretty much. So yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously it became a point and click adventure. Was that like, you know, from the, from the get go, was that your intention? Were you a big fan of point and click adventure yeah. games? Yeah. Like, I mean, much of my, much of the work I do is, is um, I guess was I guess it was revolved around point and clicks back then because they were an easy way to an easier way to get into the game industry than like an RPG game, for instance. A lot of the failures I saw were were RPG failures. So um, you know, being a long time Monkey Island fan and whatnot, it was just a, a good starting point, pretty much. And um, a, a genre, one of the genres that I hold obviously super dear to my heart and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, it must be interesting developing a title and you know for a genre that's maybe a lot more popular back in the days, like kind of gauging the interest and yeah, well, I mean, working it was, out the effort. It was you know? completely, <clears throat> excuse me, it was completely dead almost. I don't want to say completely, but it was being talked about as being as dead genre when I started Prime Audio. So I certainly didn't start it as like, oh, you know, I want to make <laughs> make a commercial commercially successful game. It was just like, I want to make a living worlds um, in, in video game form. And yeah, the point and click genre seemed like the perfect way to start that basically, yeah. Do you think that actually appealed to a lot of people? You know, there was there was a group of people still I am, looking for point and click adventures. I, I am just helped. absolutely like blown away by just the the support, the um, how much people loved my games, the point and click games. I mean, I feel like there's been a, a resurgence of the genre, somewhat of a resurgence of the genre lately, and I feel like you know if I've been a part of that in, in some way, I, you know, I'm really proud. So yeah, it's a it's really yeah, cool it's, to see it's people got that wonderful ones. wonderful kind of pace to it and uh uh slowness that we've kind of seen missing in a few games yeah. and, and the thoughtfulness as well yeah. and uh i think it's good that a new generation have kind of picked up point and click and uh you know i, I want people to coming out i think i think that's right i mean I, I want people to stop and think while they're while they're playing games that was one thing i always did in games was just stop somewhere have a look out into the background and and have a think about things think about what I've been absorbing, uh, think about what I've been thinking while I'm playing and stuff. And like little areas of Primordia, like this oubliette underneath the courthouse where there's just a small robot kind of looking out in the distance. I mean, that's, I guess, part of that footprint I, or philosophy of just, um, you know, games don't really just have to be a game all the time, do they? I don't know. Yeah, yeah I guess they can be you know kind of reflecting what you just said there taking a yeah. taking a step back you actually got me thinking quite quite a bit then and, you know sometimes i guess it it, it can be thought provoking and cinematic at the same time yeah um, i don't so see I think, why not yeah. yeah i don't see why not and i think you know that that does come across in you know in your games that we're talking about at the moment oh, so thank you. I appreciate you that. know so just kind of touching on the programming side of things so obviously you brought in mark into the studio and stuff do you have did you have any sort of hand in the programming process? Do you have any sort of programming background or is it kind of solely art and design and, you know, sound with yourself? Um, yeah, so like I started programming Primordia, um, like I said, in AGS, um, a little bit of uh, history in kind of using BASIC back in the day on an IBM 286. Um, but yeah, AGS is like a little bit handholdy, so I sort of didn't have any problems, copied a little bit of code from, from my, you know, friends on the forums and whatnot. And then um, when I decided to take Primordia Commercial, basically brought a programmer on board to do the heavy lifting on Primordia, yeah. 
And uh, I guess it was a bit of a step up from basic. Like, uh, yeah. what, what so- <laughs> software were you using well, or, or I mean, engine? Basic is just like you you, you write a, a page of words and then it becomes a, a wonky circle on the screen, um, <laughs> which is, uh, I mean, to a, I don't know, I guess 10 year old kid, that was that was pretty incredible. But uh, yeah, there's, a, there's some amazing tools out there these days. And yeah. It's, it's good to see the game was published by Wadjet iGames, mm-hmm. and uh, we, we had them recently on the podcast. Oh, okay, they, right. they were talking about their titles. Really fantastic. How, how did that relationship and uh, <clears throat> kind of connection start? Okay. Um, well, yeah, so as I said, I made the decision to publish with Wadjet mostly to get eyes on Prime Audio. Like being a newcomer in the industry, I just kind of thought I needed some help to get Prime Audio really off the ground pretty much. And uh, yeah, so it was helpful in that in that respect, yeah. I went into making Prime Audio with a really singular vision in mind. So like it was kind of do it my way or the highway in, in a lot of respects with that stuff. But, you know, having some other experience on, on board, uh, experience hands on board definitely helped with uh, at least the safe kind of, you know, having a safety net, even if you don't use it kind of thing, I guess. Yeah. And uh, obviously with it being your first kind of big release, what was the initial like reception like? Were you quite pleased? Were you proud or was it a bit nerve wracking when it first oh, came it out? Was, it was, it, I mean, it bowled me over. I, I, I knew I wanted at that point somewhere along the, the the development of Primordia I said to myself I could do this for the rest of my life I, I absolutely love doing this even mm-hmm. just point and clicks it wouldn't have to be any other, any other game but um when it was I mean I guess you could call it a commercial success um certainly for an indie studio it was it bowled me over initially obviously but it cemented my career as a game developer from that point it's fantastic so I also read that you made a game called Beacon around the same time. What's the story? Yeah. There? Okay. Yeah. Like, um, I made a few small demo, like point and click experiments leading up to the creation of Primordia, um, in AGS. I'm just keep pimping that. <laughs> keep pimping the AGS. Um, it's a, it's a great tool to do everything to prototype mm. your game. So, um, you know, from something simple to more serious coding. Um, yeah. And just Beacon was another one of those games that had like friendly floating robots and, uh, you know, kind of, a, I guess, a penchant for wanting to help humanity and robots more as like maybe tools and um, associates, partners, not so much pets, but yeah, I mean, I, I like to I like to think about um, machines and the tools of humankind in, in those kind of terms, I guess, and explore that. So let's talk about Strangeland. So you were the art and sound director of Strangeland. Was this a big mm-hmm. undertaking for you or was this kind of like, you know, you were used to this by this point? Uh, no, not really. Um, I cut my teeth long before Primordia, so Strangeland was honestly a bit easier in a lot of ways than that. The, mm. the world building was a bit trickier because I was working from someone else's story and foundation on Strangeland. But um, okay. you know, I'm I'm fairly happy with my work on that front. Yeah, very. It looks very kind of comic book uh, inspired. Some of the art and stuff. Yeah, um, there's a fair bit uh, of Geiger in in that one because um, I mean, dark. You've got to go Geiger, right? Yeah, it see, it seems like your games were getting darker and darker. And, uh, <laughs> that, that was more definitely into the, a darker period. In, yeah, <laughs> yeah, into into the Geiger stuff. Were, were you a big fan of um, uh, Geiger art and uh, oh, games I like mean, Dark Seed as well? Yeah, huge fan of Dark Seed and Dark Seed too. Um, and yeah, absolutely, give props to my man Geiger. I mean, we're both Swiss, so like, uh, yeah. And I mean, I love airbrushing as well. A lot of Strange Land, the, the art side of that for me was. Um, kind of replicating airbrushing in a way, homage to Geiger and yeah, love me some Geiger. <laughs> how, how would that work then, airbrushing as well? Would that be with a with a tablet and you'd apply oh, it as well, an like, effect? So. I, I, I had an airbrush back in high school. So like I was the kid kind of doing his own thing with an airbrush while everyone else wanted to borrow it and, and kind of replicate Geiger. And I'm like, no, you can paint other stuff with this and not just van artwork as well. So like uh, airbrush is just one of those... Um, one of the one of the tools I've used um, on and off throughout the years, I guess. Wait, you know? Van artwork? Do you mean people like? Oh, not to put down van artwork artists. They are. I'm making Devo horns right now. <laughs> They're awesome. Yeah, no, I, I just, I just totally like associate that with Australia. Yeah, you know, people customizing yeah. the van, electricity yeah. hitting the unicorn horn, and just <laughs> <laughs> rock and roll. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously strange land you know hr giga and stuff like that had a much darker tone much more of a nightmarish feel so what was the kind of like the direction there and the inspiration so was this so was this somebody else's brainchild was this was it not quite your brainchild this one 
Yeah, so that was um, that was Mark's story design, and you know, I guess going darker than Primordia wasn't really difficult for me. I mean, to be perfectly honest, there was a lot darker work that I did create that never made it into Strange Land. So, you know, although I didn't develop the the story for Strange Land at all, so I couldn't really speak on that. I mean, I was you know more of a, an artist and composer on that one. And uh, in terms and- of like composing and sound design, do you have much of a kind of like a background in that, or is it just something you? You, you know, another thing you kind of, yeah. another skill you kind of picked up along the yeah, way. Yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of one of those things I just started tinkering with as a kid and just sort of developed on and off and then got really serious about it when I started making small demo games and stuff. I was like, oh, well, you know, I can use my experience with old school samplers, synthesizers and music hardware to, you know, well, I'll, I'll do the, the soundtracks on these projects, of course. And uh, yeah, pretty much ran from there. But I, I mean, I, I build a lot of the, 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 the sound tools I use to, build it from scratch i build pretty crazy looking stuff that makes crazy sounds um you can you can see this stuff on a lot of my my platforms and on our kickstarter so, there's some pretty good videos of the klaxon it's like a it's like a portable i mean you'd really have to look at the klaxon to understand it but it does have a head headphone warning on that and then there's the uranium powered drum machine that's a whole other thing but yeah that's all up on our, <laughs> our kickstarter at the moment yeah, because I noticed that you were listing like all the synths that you were using. Right, right. Like, they were they were physical oh. synths as well, and <laughs> yeah. some of them were like circuit bent. Mm. So you must have a real kind of yeah understanding I, and uh, well, collection of them. As you well. know, when I when I realized that like circuit bending was a cheap, easy way to squeeze even more crazy sound, crazy and unique, most of all unique sounds out of the kind of synthesizers I saw lying around. Or you walk into a toy store and buy a $10 keyboard and make it sound like a horrible machine dying. That kind of fit really well (laughs) with a lot of the other stuff I was doing at the time. So, you know, that was, um, I felt like I was too old. I mean, I was in my 20s when I started circuit bending and I thought I was too old for that. And I was like, well, I guess I can do it anyway. It's not too late to start. An old dog can learn new tricks. And, you know, now I'm building my own, you know, brass etched custom gear and whatnot. It's a... Never too late to learn, wow. kids. That's that's a whole genre I could go into. Like, yeah, um, I, I, <laughs> on that. I used to love like um, some of the reggae stuff. And well, oh, love me some often, reggae. Yeah, that that Dumb would be reggae. circuit bent, but usually because it was built incorrectly, right? And it would just make really weird sounds. Yeah, like, and, uh, and I think that adds dub, new sounds. And dub stuff, reggae, you know? I love. Like they they invented the tape echo or invented using it. You know, throughout all of the, the genre, it's almost a genre built on. I mean, it's called dub because of tape dubs. So it's like, um, yeah, yeah you're messing around with tape recorders, spring reverbs, all that kind of stuff. It's just um, kind of home built synths by Lee Scratch Perry. And yeah, stuff yeah. Like that. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's lovely. It's, it's yeah. one of the many things. Like it's it's what's great about being a game developer for me because if I get bored with doing something, I can move on to something else. But it's another avenue that leads to the game itself like the games for me are more than some of their parts and I, I can change what i'm doing on my desk at the time but the work i'm doing is still going to lead to creating the game so it's not like i'm you know dropping a project which i guess well you know i've done before i was a game dev so yeah it's a it's a thing for me i guess you could say it must be quite nice uh, yeah. if you it, like like if you kind of get writer's block then you can move on mm-hmm. to the different yeah exactly and, and when it's get back into when it's it, all yeah. going really right everything works together like a concerto um yeah and that's when that's when the real magic happens i guess yeah so uh i've got got to fit one in here you mentioned uh uranium powered instruments <laughs> <laughs> okay now there ask about are some that. radioactive elements lying around here and there um but yeah the, the drum machine isn't actually uranium powered it's it's powered by high voltage which i am very careful around um you just don't want to you know don't go trying to circuit bend or do anything with high voltages without learning a bit about it you just get a yeah. get something on batteries basically but um yeah it's 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 essentially um a gigantic yamaha psr 6300 like granddad's old keyboard that he might play on a sunday night on on christmas eve or something and um i just had it lying around i couldn't Mm. well at the time i couldn't afford to buy a nice new you know well i really want to buy some you know old school gear but the prices have exploded on that stuff lately so i'm like well i'll circuit bend this great big old grandfather keyboard and then how can I make it smaller because it weighs literally three tons? Well, I mean, the uranium drum machine is still huge, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> you just kind of thing you just got to listen to and, and look at, I guess, you know. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about your current Kickstarter project, which is a uh, Hibernaculum. So that's currently on Kickstarter. 
Hibernaculum, yeah. Is that my saying? That's correct. Right? Oh, yeah, no, sorry. I was just, I was just trying to say it sound creepy in the background. <laughs> we, <laughs> you said about we covered it in our news article uh, last week on the show, and mm-hmm. I, I kept saying it wrong. I was like, oh, cool. Hibernaculum. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, uh, we spoke about it on our show last week. So, Hibernaculum, we, me and Ravi, we absolutely love the look of this game, and we're really excited about it. So, we've oh, awesome. um, got a few. You got a few days left on the Kickstarter when we yeah when yeah still got a few comes days. out. So mm-hmm. uh, tell us about it. Tell tell us about it. Well, you know, um, Hibernaculum. It's uh, it's what can I say that the that the spiel on Kickstarter doesn't. I mean, I could say it's it's a it's a creepy world where you won't want to leave. I could say you'll spend like ten minutes maybe rummaging through a bucket of yellow cake radioactive dust to find some ammunition, over irradiate your hand, and then have to struggle back to home base to get yourself stitched up before the cyborgs creep up behind you or perhaps go angling for some mutoid salamanders in a nearby radioactive pool um yeah i've i should i'll start rambling <laughs> but <laughs> go it's, for it. i'm glad i'm glad to hear you guys uh, are digging what i'm putting out there with with hyper so far i've, I've started calling it hyper because um it has a lot of a lot of syllables to mm-hmm. say 400 times a day and uh yeah that's really um, i don't I'm not sure if I've listened to your podcast that I'll check it out right away if not because um yeah there's just so much going on with the with the campaign right now and um I've got a lot of like kind of ideas in my back pocket that I'm sort of finishing up a lot of assets mm. and yeah there's a few surprises left around the corner um every corner I guess you could say kind of like in the rotting superstructure of Hibernaculum so yeah. As, uh, oh, one question I want to ask is: um, uh, Were you a fan of Westwood Studios? Oh, then? Is this Westwood. Kind of I mean, inspiration Wormwood, of Wormwood. Westwood. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's um, one of the biggest inspirations. Um, huge inspiration. Um, everything from the development side, music, graphically, um, the way their games feel. Um, yeah, I've, I've modeled. I've, I've, I could you could say I've modeled myself from my studio after Westwood in a lot of ways. Um, that's another topic that you don't want to get me started on, but yeah, I'll just give shout outs to Kyrandia and I of the Beholder right now, and they made some amazing games. <laughs> I, I guess that whole kind of package of like, uh, you know, f- full entertainment with the sound and, yeah. and the visuals and no, all of that is kind uh, of what you're doing absolutely, solo. Absolutely. Their, their, their games like didn't feel like products. They felt like, I mean, to me, polished paintings. I mean, as a kid, it was Kyrandia was a painting that you'd step inside and live inside um, before Morrowind or anything like that. And yeah, I, I love them to death. <laughs> so obviously, Hyber isn't a point and click adventure. It's a, it's a dungeon crawler. So tell, tell us the, the inspiration in the direction there. Why, why the change? Okay, so... So Hibernaculum, I mean, it really came about um, from my, my love of, of old school dungeon crawlers. These are these are like, yeah, the Westwood titles that were before, you know, CRPGs like Baldur's Gate. And they they fit, they fit in a really small niche right before 3D graphics came out. So you had fake 2D movement, which I love because it's pixel art, and especially if it's Westwood. And uh, there was titles like Elvira in the genre, which brought this like macabre, horror aesthetic to you know general dungeoneering i mean that was that was one box set that when a kid brought El- the box set of elvira to school i was like oh an rpg game like eye of the beholder but it has the kind of horror that mom and dad won't let me watch i was mm. just obsessed instantly so i mean hibernaculum really started or came about i guess looking back at those experiences a lot but you could say the crux of it really is I was scratching my head and saying w- w- you know what's the what's the big new What's the big new dungeon crawler um, with pixelated graphics? It, it just never really existed. And sort of Ishar came along, um, Ultima Underworld came along, then you know, Fallout, Baldur's Gate and whatnot. And sort of, yeah, Elvira, I the Beholder, these these titles sort of I felt like got left behind. And um, I've always been obsessed with them. So Hibernaculum obviously started out as revisiting that and, of course, wanted to do my own thing. But then I started to realize, why do I have to stop at what, old dungeon crawlers did why do i have to stop with a bunch of stacked levels like eye of the beholder with push plate puzzles that you ram up against and then like i know that's not what i want to go back and play now I, I, these games still feel and look great to play without the nostalgia goggles on but there's you know there's a lot of flaws in these things so not only did i want to bring modern convenience to it just with interface and what ui user interface and whatnot but um i thought why not take some of the you know classic rpg sensibilities from Baldur's gate and fallout back in time into the original you know false three um false 3d dungeon crawling genre so that's you know 
when I talk about um, what I want to do with a gameplay of Hibernacle, um, it's kind of hard to describe because it's a long conversation. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I'm trying to bring a lot of kind of future ideas back into the past of dungeon crawling with Hibernacle um, and giving it, of course, my own flesh, uh, my own draped, rotting flesh covering uh, with some endoskeleton electrics underneath. And yeah, hopefully a really interesting kind of survival, survival horror survival simulator i've said survival too, <laughs> too many times now but it might not be that easy to quote unquote survive in a i don't know a gigantic generation ship with holes so large that you know rain clouds precipitate up above uh, the you know farmland once existed in this in this ship um yeah uh, again now i'll start talking about speculative fiction and go back to you know um orphans of the sky by robert heinlein which our friends at iron tower released an, an amazing game um of called space colony i believe um based on the same uh, the same novel it's been a big inspiration for me i've got it in my hands here it's uh, robert heinlein's orphans of the sky of course that's one of, of many of my inspirations for hibernacle another big one is heliconia series by brian aldis which is sort of a telling of sort of generational ecology and tells uh, the story of a, of a world over um, hundreds of generations or, or multiple generations and sort of looking at what life of flora fauna do over that time and, and especially how they interact with each other so that's kind of a big part of my exploration of the ship myself is is looking at what happens to beings when they change over time what's what happens when they interact and then i'm going to throw the player in there with a broken hammer a couple of rusty cartridges for a, a gun that probably doesn't work until they find something better. Maybe some padded armor. Um, and yeah, see how they go. Maybe you'll get the plus one shield of, you know, reflexive mechanical defense, which of course is, is a callback to Eye of the Beholder. They had plus one magical shields. My plus one shields give a benefit because mechanical um, plates reflect rico and ricochet bullets when they detect missiles incoming. So I'm also trying to bring a bit of my kind of I was going to say technical smarts. I'm not going to use that word. Just a bit of my, I don't know, um, my machine idealism into the realm of, I wouldn't say fantasy, but yeah, the the role, the realm of dungeoneering, you could say. It's um, interesting that you mention the interface as well, because the interface has aspects that you wouldn't find in a traditional dungeon crawler, but yeah. actually like the mini map, you know, make it <laughs> ah, <yes. laughs> a, a lot easier. What, okay. what were the kind of considerations about, you know, modernizing it yeah. and um, keeping that balance? Mm, yeah. I mean, like the mini map was, was just the first one and it was a no brainer. I, I didn't want to force modern players to have to map out every dungeon on pen and paper, which is what a lot of us did back in the day. So just the first thought was, well, mini map on the screen at all times, then over the you know over the years and months have you know expanded that to say well why can't you bring up a larger map and set a nav point that then appears as like a waypoint you know line to follow along on the mini map to make navigation easier so there's a lot of um like modern conveniences in that sort of aspect or that facet of the game but i guess the rest of the ui i mean it follows the fibonacci spiral it it brings a lot from a lot of the best old dungeon crawlers on board and sort of does what I want it to. It is a work in progress, but I mean, you know, it's, it's my favorite UI of any UI in the genre just because, well, I tried to make it what I wanted to see and, and yeah, that's pretty much what it is. And it, 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 and it seems inspired by lots of kind of mm. older titles as well. Absolutely. And it, Absolutely. It's, it's got that style, uh, you know, parts of it remind me of syndicate. Yeah. Um, parts <laughs> of it also remind me of like, of our older dungeon crawlers or Elvira or something. Uh, yeah, there's, like, um, so, there's so many titles I could name right now. There's a, there's a little bit of everything in there. And I made a point, <clears throat> excuse me, more recently to revisit all of the old, just basically everything in the genre, you know, um, like games like, like Perihelion, which I thought were obscure. Actually, not that obscure. There's much more obscure ones with even worse interfaces. And I, I'm going back and playing those, I'm like, well, I'm changing a lot here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it that way yeah i'm um, not to put those old games down because i've got yeah nothing but love for the for the four yeah you, you've reached a point where you can do the kind of improvements and uh you know make make yeah. it a bit easier on yeah people as well. yeah um, i mean someone asked about an ms dos port i mean look that kind of thing i have so much respect for I, i've got mad respect for people making brand new games on the commodore these days but that's not what i'm doing with wormwood studios you know we're um we're making something modern that does look back at the past but is also its own thing um you know it, it 
kind of is entirely its own thing in a way. I mean, everyone says that about their own projects, of course, but I guess you'll just have to say, wait and see on that one. One thing that I used to have when I played Dungeon Crawlers was the repetitiveness of mm. backgrounds and yeah. textures. I'd always get yeah. lost. How, yeah. how have you managed to define the uh, areas? That is a big one for me. So I, I've, I've mapped out so much of this gigantic ship. I, I've got a wall covered in, in, in just many, many corners of this rotting, rotting superstructure. I've paid, I'm paying a lot of attention to that. And like, you know, why aren't there just objects in the levels? Why can't we have multiple textures on a wall set? I've got to keep everything really pixelated originally. Obviously I can't, I can't be mixing resolution. I can't be throwing actual 3d or anything in there. I, I'm, I have a very specific um, pixel resolution I'm going for, but at the same time, like, yeah, I can put, um, blood splatters here. I can put broken down machines there. I can also set up the levels in a way that not only mirrors how the functionality of an actual generation ship would be, but creates a lot of variation just in the spaces you have. Uh, you know, there's old like aquaponics farms that are now broken down and taken over by factions or monsters. Uh, we have a large best diary too, but yeah, I, I, I'm. I guess you could sum it up by saying I'm doing kind of everything I can to step away from the old stack puzzles like Sudoku in a magazine and really kind of trying to build a world you can explore, a, a real world you can explore and, and sink your teeth into. So how's the reaction been so far, you know, from kind of like the backers and the fans and stuff like mm. that? No, again, the, the the reaction has just been almost overwhelming. I, I started High Vernaculum thinking this is going to be less popular than my other games because I seem to be the only one that really wants to see this stuff come to life. And I'm, I'm just going to kind of make it from, going to make it for myself and, if anyone else likes it, um, that would be awesome. Um, and it turns out, well, it looks like a whole lot of people like it. And it's just, I'm, I mean, I'm overjoyed, obviously. I, I love storytelling. Um, mm. I love just sharing kind of, I was going to say, it's not the inside of my head. It's like, I see it in imagination and ideas kind of like, I always think of a quote from David Lynch where, you know, they're just, they're just floating around up there and you, you can just pluck them down and, and use them and, I guess that's another part of the philosophy I bring into game development. But, yeah, you know, it's it's really great to see uh, people behind the game as much as, as I am. So, you know, I love, love our fans, everyone out there. Big, you know, shout outs and props to everyone that's followed along from the start. I love, love you all. <laughs> love you guys too. This has been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting to see as well that your um, uh, Primordia has a kind of a, a basis of a film or there's going to be a film adaption of well, it uh, what, 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 what's happening there I've that's been in really talks, interesting um i've been in talks with bastian koch i believe it's pronounced koch or koch um we, i don't do many <laughs> skype calls with um but basically yeah he's he's been shopping around primordia for a, a netflix deal um now i'm not sure how close that is yet because that's a separate team working on that um, but yeah, I'm incredibly excited about that to say the least. I, I was a little tight lipped for a while, but now that it seems like things are a little further along, um, yeah, just, that's another aspect of, of the studio that I'm really excited about right now, basically. Yeah. And, um, seeing Primordia come back to life is, well, it's something special for me, definitely. So in terms of the Kickstarter with Hyber, it's, you know, you've, you've achieved the goal, the game is coming out. You've got a few mm -hmm. bonus tiers on there. What so if people want to still get involved in these last couple of days, you know what what have you got to offer for them? Yeah, well, I'm, like I said, I still have a few um, tricks up my sleeve. You could say there's. Uh, I feel like we've been baking a cake and saving the icing and the confection for last because <laughs> that's you, how you should do things. So, I mean, I think we're halfway to a switch release stretch goal at the moment. That would be a release on release of, our, of the other platforms. But yeah. we have a lot of really juicy, um, I guess, yeah, more treat-like member. I don't want to use the word member berry, but yeah, there's going to be some juicy updates very soon. So yeah, stay tuned, basically. Fantastic. And uh, our final question is, when can we expect the game? Okay, so we, we've set a tentative release in Q3 2025. Um, but yeah, we're, we're very confident with that date. And uh, we're just going to keep all of our backers updated along the way um, as often as possible. I like to stay really active with everyone on our Discord, on Twitter, as it melts down, moving over to other platforms. And yeah, we'll just um, we'll just keep everyone updated as we go along and see what happens. Are there, are there any genres that you'd like to kind of explore in future and, and oh, jump into? Um, I have a four letter word for you, C-R-P-G. 
Oh, ho. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> awesome. Well, well cool. Victor, it's been absolutely awesome having you on the podcast. Yeah, Ravi, and, uh, best of luck with the title as well. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic talking to you guys. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah.